there shall be signs in the sun, and in the moon, and in the stars, and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear, and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. One man, one microphone, one mission, one message. True News, the only newscast reporting the countdown to the second coming of Jesus Christ. And now for the most powerful hour on radio, here is End Time Newsman, Rick Wiles. This is True News, one hour of uncensored news, views, and commentary. Welcome to the program. I'm Rick Wiles. Today is Monday, July 9, 2012. Dr. Noriel Robini, the New York economist known as Dr. Doom, told CNBC today that the perfect storm scenario that he predicted several months ago is unfolding right now in the global economy. Last May, he predicted that the U.S. economy would stall again, debt troubles in Europe would worsen, emerging markets, including China, will slow down, and a Middle East war would come together to create the perfect storm by late 2012 or early 2013. Wow. He must be listening to true news. By the way, I'll call Swiss investor Mark Faber at his home in Thailand later in the program to get his thoughts about Dr. Rabini's perfect storm warning about the global financial system and any other thoughts that Mark Faber would like to pass on to us. Very wise and successful businessman. Looking forward to hearing what he has to say today. First, however, let's talk about another matter that even Dr. Rabini hasn't considered in his perfect storm scenario. A surprise Russian nuclear attack on the USA. Bill Gertz, writing in the FreeBeacon.com website, reported that two Russian strategic nuclear bombers entered the U.S. air defense zone near the U.S. West Coast on the 4th of July. Both Russian nuclear bombers were met by U.S. interceptor jets. It was the second time in two weeks that Russian nuclear bombers have penetrated the 200-mile zone surrounding the USA. In June, two Russian Tu-95 Bear bombers flew close to Alaska as part of an Arctic war game that a Russian military spokesman said included simulated attacks on enemy air defenses and strategic facilities. A Pentagon official said the July 4 incident came close to the U.S. coast, but the Russian bombers did not enter the 12-mile zone that the U.S. considers sovereign airspace. According to Bill Gertz, the Russian bomber flights near the Pacific on July 4th and the earlier flights near Alaska appear to be signs that Moscow is practicing the targeting of its long-range air-launched cruise missiles on two strategic U.S. missile defense sites, one at Fort Greeley, Alaska, and the second site at Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. Vandenberg is the headquarters of the U.S. missile defense system. In May, Russian General Nikolai Makarov, chief of the Russian general staff, said during a Moscow news conference that because missile defense systems are destabilizing, he said this, quote, a decision on preemptive use of the attack weapons available will be made when the situation worsens. End of quote. The comments highlighted Russian opposition to U.S. deployment of missile defense interceptors and sensors in Europe along the Russian border. The June 18 intrusion near Fort Greeley, Alaska, happened on the same day Barack Obama and Vladimir Putin were photographed staring away from each other during an icy cold news conference at a G20 summit in Mexico. Reporters said there was heavy tension in the room between the two men. The Fars News Agency reported that Iran entered into the second day of a large air defense exercise that simulated the penetration of enemy planes into its territory. Ground-to-air missile and artillery systems were tested to repel an attack on the Islamic Republic's nuclear facilities. Meanwhile, Syria is also conducting large-scale military maneuvers simulating an invasion of that country. 
The exercise started on Saturday and included both air and ground forces and the firing of live missiles in response to an invasion. Turkey and Saudi Arabia have mobilized troops and artillery on their borders north and south of Syria. The war games also included Syrian naval forces repelling an attack from the sea. Never before have Iranian and Syrian armed forces carried out simultaneous and coordinated war exercises. True News broadcast two powerful interviews in June with British men who fear a deadly, sinister plot to blow up the Olympic Games in London may be planned. British intelligence expert Michael Shrimpton was tipped off by a Russian spy that a nuclear bomb had been transported into London to explode during the Games. He also said that the plot was uncovered by U.S. and British intelligence officials who then monitored by satellite the removal of the nuclear bomb on a submarine. Now, later, a British reporter told us that he went undercover to get a job as a security guard with G4S, a global private security company that has a big contract to protect the games. He said the hiring process of security guards is a farce. There is little or no training, and the metal detectors don't detect metal. He also said there are body bags stored nearby the stadium to hold up to 800,000 human corpses and 100,000 soldiers, mostly American and German, are stationed outside London at a British military base to evacuate the city if there is a weapons of mass destruction event. And right on schedule, the London Telegraph reported that a suspected al-Qaeda terrorist whom MI5 believes is a possible suicide bomber, was found repeatedly near the Olympic Park in Stratford, East London. No explanation about why this unidentified al-Qaeda terrorist is allowed to walk around freely in London and the stadium. Between now and the opening day of the Olympics, July 27, I would not be surprised that the news media tells us that the ghost of Saddam Hussein and Osama bin Laden and Muammar Gaddafi were seen walking hand in hand through the stadium. The London Guardian reported that security guards working for Serco, the private company hired to guard Britain's borders during the Olympics, had been at the center of a series of security breaches that allowed vehicles to enter Great Britain without screening for possible radiological dirty bombs. Budget cuts forced the British government to hire private security guards to man radars designed to detect radiation at major ports. In one security failure, Serco guards did not alert anybody when the security security screening system stopped operating at the Dover Ferry Port, allowing vehicles from Europe to enter the country unchecked for radiation. Some of the private guards have also left vital areas unmanned, and they've missed alarms that are expected to alert guards that a more more thorough search of vehicles is required. Over 320,000 foreign visitors are expected to enter Britain during the games that start July 27. A magnitude 5.7 earthquake centered in Turkey rattled Jerusalem and Tel Aviv, Israel today, and the sun erupted its most powerful solar flare of the summer. It was the latest in a string of powerful solar storms this week. The latest eruption occurred shortly after 7 p.m. Friday. It registered as a Class X 1.1 flare, one of the strongest types of solar flares possible. The storm disrupted shortwave radio signals in some parts of the world. NASA scientists predicted in 2010 that solar cycle 24 will peak in May 2013. A massive solar flare could cause global chaos in 2013, causing blackouts and wrecking satellite communications. NASA has warned that a peak in the sun's magnetic energy cycle and the number of sunspots or flares around 2013 could generate huge radiation levels. The resulting solar storm could cause a geomagnetic storm on Earth, knocking out electricity grids around the world, possibly up to months bringing normal life to a halt. 
a woman who witnessed the 1968 assassination of Senator Robert F. Kennedy has agreed to testify on behalf of the convicted assassin, Sirhan Sirhan, who is seeking a new trial. Nina Rhodes Hughes insists that Sirhan was not the only gunman firing shots when Senator Kennedy was gunned down only a few feet away from her at a Los Angeles hotel. The hotel was demolished several years ago, thus removing the walls that were peppered with more bullet holes than Sirhan could have possibly fired at RFK. She says there were two guns firing from separate positions and that U.S. authorities altered her account of the crime. She told CNN, What has to come out is that there was another shooter to my right. The truth has got to be told. No more cover-ups. She's been furious for years at the FBI for altering her testimony. She told the FBI in 1968 that there were more than eight shots fired, but the FBI report says that Mrs. Rhodes Hughes said otherwise. She told CNN that she informed authorities in 68 that the number of gunshots she counted in the kitchen pantry exceeded eight, which would have been more than the maximum Sirhan could have fired and that some of the shots came from a location in the pantry other than Sirhan's position. Rhodes Hughes told CNN the FBI's eight-shot claim is completely false. She said the FBI twisted things when she told FBI agents who interviewed her in 1968. She said, I never said eight shots. I never, never said it. She said that during the FBI interview in her Los Angeles home, One month after the June 68 assassination, she told the agents that she heard from 12 to 14 shots. She says she believes senior FBI officials altered the statement she made to conform with what they wanted the public to believe. She said, when they say only eight shots, the anger within me is so great that I practically, I get very emotional because it is untrue. It is so untrue. Uh, The U.S. District Court in Los Angeles is set to rule on a request by Sirhan, now 68 years old, that he be released, retried, or granted a hearing based on new evidence. Some people have speculated that Sirhan Sirhan was an CIA MK Ultra assassin, mind control. While I'm on the subject of government officials lying, WorldNet Daily's Jerome Corsi reported that two separate database reports from the National Student Clearinghouse have contradicted Barack Obama's claim that he attended Columbia University for two years. The reports have added to the intrigue generated by Obama's unwillingness to discuss his time at the institution and his refusal to release his educational records and the fact that most of the students and faculty there in the 1980s, say they don't even remember him. Some people have speculated that Obama was working for the CIA in Pakistan during the 1981-1982 school year. According to WorldNet Daily, the clearinghouse received permission from Columbia University to make a statement about the discrepancy in Obama's college records. Dr. Corsi asked the clearinghouse, why do clearinghouse records indicate Obama was at the school only during the 1982-83 school year, while Obama and Columbia spokesmen have insisted he began attending the New York City School in the fall of 1981. Janine Greenwood, vice president and general counsel for the Clearinghouse, told Dr. Corsi it was a computer error that messed things up. She says it's been fixed, and now the records show that Obama did attend two years not just one. So there you have it. You got your explanation. Satisfied now? It fits with the fake birth certificate posted on the White House website and the use of a dead man's social security number and the mysterious ownership of his house in Chicago. But don't question what you're told. Just believe what the government says. And if they said Sirhan Sirhan shot RFK, then who are you to listen to an eyewitness who heard 14 shots? Just believe what you're told. Internet search engine giant Google is stepping up its political activism in support of homosexuality. The company kicked off on Saturday its new Legalize Love propaganda campaign. The campaign will focus on countries around the world 
that outlaw homosexual behavior, especially because of strong religious moral beliefs. Speaking at the Global LGBT Workplace Summit in London, Google executive Mark Palmer Edgecombe told the homosexual activists, quote, we want our employees who are gay or lesbian or transgender to have the same experience outside the office as they do in the office. I don't want to know what kind of experiences they're having in or out of the offices. Legalized Love is a campaign to promote safer conditions for gay and lesbian people inside and outside the office in countries with anti-gay laws on the books, Google said in a written statement. And Target stores, the retail chain that once banned the Salvation Army from ringing bells in front of its stores at Christmas time to collect donations for the poor, announced that it would sell gay pride t-shirts and donate 100% of the proceeds to a homosexual activist group supporting same-sex marriage and adoptions of children by gay couples. Target is donating the money to help the pro-homosexual rights group Family Equality Council to defeat the Minnesota Marriage Amendment that will be on the ballot this November. Target Communications Director Molly Snyder told CNSNews.com, Target supports inclusivity and diversity in every aspect of our business and has a long history of supporting LGBT community through giving, volunteerism, and event sponsorship and participation. So don't forget what she just said. And the next time that you pull into a mall parking lot, you remember what little Miss Molly said about Target's long history of supporting homosexual rights. And don't forget that they ban the Christian Salvation Army bell ringers from collecting donations for the poor. You just remember that the next time you get ready to go into a Target store. And Detroit, Michigan has been on hard times in recent years. Now an entrepreneur has an idea to bring the city back to life. Mr. Mark Sewak wants to build a 200-acre zombie themed amusement park in a rundown section of Motor City. Park visitors will be chased by a zombie horde through abandoned factories, homes, and stores. Zombies and park visitors will, will wear tearaway patches similar to flag football games. Humans will turn into zombies once their patches are ripped off, and zombies will be eliminated once they lose their patches. The person who collects the most patches wins the game. Mr. Seawalk is not the only businessman trying to make a buck on the new fascination with zombies. An out-of-business truck stop in Georgia will open in September as a paintball park called Atlanta Zombie Apocalypse, where paintball combatants will battle the walking dead. You're listening to True News. I'm Rick Wiles. We'll take a break. And when I come back, international investor Mark Faber will be on the telephone from his home in Thailand with his comments and analysis about the meltdown of the global financial system. But more importantly, how you can stay on top, how you can navigate around the minefield that the money masters have laid for all of us. You don't have to be a victim. Listen, you and I, we know God. We know the creator of the universe, and we don't have to allow the evil plots of Satan and those who, who adore him and support him. We don't have to allow their plots to bring us down. We can be the head and not the tail. We need to stand firmly on the promises of God, believe what he says in his word, and we are to go forth carrying the banner of Jesus Christ. You and I have a job to do. And that is to take the gospel of the kingdom into all the world, make disciples of all men and women, teach the commandments of God, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, cast out the devils, lay hands on the sick, and heal them all in the name of Jesus Christ. And we will be doing that until the very last day. No financial meltdown Nothing is going to stop the glorious church of Jesus Christ from fulfilling the Great Commission. We are the body of Christ, and the body of Christ has legs, and it will continue to walk and declare 
the wonders of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm Rick Wiles. I'll be back in a minute. You're listening to True News, the end time newscast. Rick will return after this announcement. Can you know that your actions please God? Here's today's moment with Charles Stanley. Now, we receive lots of emails here at In Touch, and oftentimes they deal with the same issues. And here are a couple that I think are very interesting, and uh, I think uh, people can be encouraged by these. Listen to this. One of them says, I struggle on a daily basis with temptation and always fall short of where I know God wants me to be. Because of that, I fear I'm missing the true plan God has for my life. Now, I want you to remember that when I'm going to read the second one. Listen. Here's one from Naomi. She wants to follow God, but feels she's lost. She writes, I recently turned 50 years of age and took an early retirement at age 48 from a company that I had known as my second home for 30 years. I knew that there was something more out there and I needed to find it. Now I talk to God every day and don't know which direction to turn. Am I supposed to be where I am right now in my life? Now, both of these emails are like many we receive, and both people are simply saying this. You know, I'm trying to do my best, but I don't know whether God's pleased or not. I don't know which way to turn at this point in my life. And let me say this. God does not want to judge you. God wants to encourage you and help you to know His will and plan for your life. And both of these people are saying, I don't know what to do next. I don't know which way to turn. Well, I want to give you a scripture in the 32nd Psalm that's very encouraging. It's encouraged me all of my life. When he says in this passage, in the 8th verse, I will instruct you and teach you in the way which you should go. I will guide you with my eye upon you. God is willing to answer your prayer. He desires that you know his will and plan and purpose for your life. And oftentimes when people do not know God's purpose and plan, they feel guilty. And it may be that you feel that way. Well, you know, God must be displeased with me because I'm not sure I'm doing the right thing. Well, let me remind you of something about the judgment seat of Christ. And that is, on what basis does he judge us, knowing that we're Christians now? You're not going to be lost. That's not what this judgment's all about. But upon what basis does he judge us? Three things, and I think you can remember these. Number one. How much truth do you know? And secondly, how much opportunity do you have? And thirdly, how are you responding to the opportunities God has given you? Now, here are some folks, like many others, who are saying, you know, I want to do what's right. I'm not sure what right is at this point. I don't know how God wants to use me. Listen, if you will ask Him to show you, He will make it crystal clear. Only someone who has accepted God's offer of forgiveness can have this kind of a relationship with Him. Learn how to become a Christian when you visit us at InTouch.org. Well, welcome back to segment two of True News for Monday, July 9, 2012. I'm Rick Wiles. European leaders held a summit on June 28 to solve the debt crisis. Once again, they proudly announced an even bigger bailout scheme. Once again, they told the public that the bailout mechanism would solve the crisis. Earlier in June, they had announced a $125 billion bailout of Spanish banks. The word was quietly released late last week, however, that the Spanish bank bailout money won't be available until the second half of 2013. Again and again, the politicians and the central bankers and the IMF bureaucrats announce grand schemes to end the crisis, but weeks later we always learn there really was no solution, only another news conference. Economist Dr. Noriel Robini startled a Bloomberg TV journalist a few days ago with a brutally stark analysis of the European debt crisis. He sees a perfect storm brewing that will converge in 2013. He said that the European Central Bank does not have six months to solve the European debt crisis, but perhaps only two weeks. He also said some bankers need to go to prison or, quote, somebody will hang in the streets, end of quote. He was uh, referring to the LIBOR interest rate rigging scandal in Great Britain. 
Obviously, his tough talk is evidence that the situation is worsening, and the people who are paying attention know it. Well, one man whose words are listened to by multitudes of people around the world is on the telephone. Mr. Mark Faber is a Swiss investor and an investment analyst who has a long track record in simply being right. He is the author of the book, Tomorrow's Gold, Asia's Age of Discovery. He's best known for his newsletter, Gloom, Boom, and Doom Report. His website, markfaberblog.blogspot.com. Mr. Faber, it's an honor to have you back on the program. How are you today? Very well, thank you, and thank you for having me on the program. Yes, sir. Uh, let's start with this uh, LIBOR interest rate rigging scandal. Uh, the uh, Sunday Times said that this uh, the scandal could could result in trillions of dollars of damages being claimed in lawsuits. How serious is it? Well, I think there will be a lot of lawsuits. As you know, in America, everybody sues everybody for anything that uh, comes about. So there will be lawsuits. Uh, to what extent the damages have been caused by the rigging of LIBOR, I don't know. But uh, clearly, we see that the financial sector is not 100% clean, and that's why a very large number of individuals, they do not want to have anything to do with stock investments any longer. In other words, there have been, since 2008, $500 $500 billion flowing out of equity mutual funds. There's a reason for that. People have lost confidence in the integrity of the financial system. Uh, regarding uh, the, the latest European bailout scheme, uh, and they've announced two in, in recent weeks in the month of June. First, the, the $125 billion bailout of the Spanish banks, and then a week or two later, they had the big summit, and it was close to a trillion-dollar bailout for, for Italy and Spain. L- let's start with the Spanish bank bailout. They're now admitting the money isn't there. It won't be available till sometime in the second half of 2013. Uh, w- what do you think are going to be the ramifications of this uh, admission of truth? Basically, that's what they're saying, but push to shovel, it may be available sooner. But very clearly, unlike the U.S., where we have a federal government, in Europe we have sovereign states. And if the one or the other states have a constitution that prevents them from extending loans, then you run into roadblock. And so it's not that simple. But even if you gave all the Spanish banks and all the Italian government agencies and the government all the money what they wanted today, the problem would still not be solved. And the problem is too much debt and too much government involvement in the economy. Uh, What do you make of of Dr. Rabini's statement uh, on Bloomberg TV that that the European Central Bank has only two weeks to solve this this crisis? Well, I don't think that they could postpone the crisis within the next two weeks. But solving it is another story. You know, with monetary measures, you can postpone all the problems, as has happened in the U.S. for the last 30 years, with repeated bailouts, starting with the SNL crisis and Mexico, then LTCM, and then uh, the bailout, essentially, of NASDAQ when it collapsed through artificial low interest rates, creating the housing bubble, and then, then. But you don't solve the problem. You just kick it down the road. How is this problem going to be solved? Or how sh- let's, let's say, how should it be solved? Good question. First of all, if you really analyze why do we have a problem in the world, it's not because the market has failed, but because repeated interventions by governments 
with monetary measures, in other words, printing money, and fiscal measures, large uh, fiscal deficits, have actually produced a crisis, nothing else. And so the same policymakers that brought about the crisis are now supposed to solve it with the same medicine that brought about the crisis. That sounds insane, doesn't it? Well, it is insane, but if I were in the shoes of a policymaker today, I might do the same, because to do the right thing, you will certainly not be re-elected. You understand? The right thing would be to take another medicine, which is austerity, in other words, boost savings rate, diminish the debt level, and this could be very painful for two or three years, extremely painful. Mm -hmm. Well, it's very. Sim it's, nobody wants to do that. Yeah, what they're doing so, is is very similar to to uh, you know a doctor who's prescribing medicine to a patient, and and he knows that that the uh, you know the one pharmaceutical drug will work on one problem, but it's going to cause say liver damage, and then he's going to uh, then he's going to then secondly, he's going to give secondly. a yeah, and then he's going to give the, the patient mm -hmm. he treats the symptoms and not the causes of the illness. That's right. So, so we're at um, we're almost at Judgment Day. I mean, it's it's really really close. The day of reckoning, uh, as you say, these these problems have been postponed for decades. It's not just a few years. This has been going on for decades, and a lot of uh, powerful, influential, and wealthy people made a very good living during their lifetime, knowing that they were postponing a, a, a huge crisis to another day. Uh, of money is very favorable for a minority and unfavorable for the majority. And so the wealth inequality increases. But these are all issues we can discuss for hours and hours and come to the conclusion that the world is an unfair and unjust place. We, as investors, have to live with it. That's right. So, and the key is to understand that everything may look horrible, but if you print money, it doesn't mean that stocks will tumble. I suppose eventually they will, but between now and the tumble, there may be lots of things that can happen. Um. The way this crisis should be solved and the way it will be solved, obviously, are, are two different um, subjects. And uh, as you say, we could talk for hours about, about how we got here and, and, and the right way it should be done. But we, we know that the politicians and the bureaucrats and the, the, the financial uh, maestros who got us into this mess are not going to voluntarily give up power. They're not going to admit that they've made a mess of the world. Uh, they're going to continue to try to fix it. So yes, yes. But equally, we have to admit and concede that we are all guilty because nobody who is a recipient of Medicare and of Social Security or of pensions will agree to have his benefits cut. That we also have to see. Mm-hmm. Because in the end effect, we vote for the people that are in government. And if Mr. Obama hands out money to people that work for General Motors and to food stamp recipients and to disability insurance recipients and so forth and so on, you can buy votes. But these people, they know. If they don't vote for Mr. Obama, maybe they get less benefits, so they rather vote for Mr. Obama. And that's the problem of democracy, that everybody wants a larger stake of the cake that is really available for distribution. Yes, but you know, recall Margaret Thatcher's famous words that the problem with socialism is that you eventually run out of other people's money. <laughs> Okay, yes. so we're almost but, there, uh, Mr. Faber. <laughs> at the same time, that 
the money printing and the negative real interest rates, in other words, we, there is inflation in the system, we all know that. Health care is going up, insurance premiums are going up, rents are going up, and so wherever you look, prices are going up. But on your deposits, you get essentially zero interest rates. So we have negative real interest rates, and that is highly beneficial for corporate profits. So you understand? Mm -hmm. The Social Security recipients, they're happy to get the Social Security, and the corporate sector is happy to have negative real interest rates and to print money because the corporate profits are at the record. And so the merry-go-round continues until there will be the day of reckoning. Uh, here in the United States, if you ask the Social Security Administration if, if Social Security is solvent at the present time, and they would say, yes, we have plenty of money. We don't foresee problems until the year whatever, 2050 or whatever. But the truth is, Mr. Faber, that, that there, is a, there is a vault, there's a building outside of Washington, D.C. with binders, and each binder has... Uh, hundreds of, of IOUs from the U.S. Treasury Department to the Social Security Administration because over decades, the U.S. Treasury borrowed $3 trillion from the Social Security Fund. So yeah, when, sure. when they say, the when they say it's solvent, it's I'm not negative. solvent. And this is not even the worst. The worst is actually the Medicare unfunded liabilities. That is the worst part. But anyway, you know, we live in this bizarre time, mm -hmm. and for sure it will come to a bad end. Now, Mr. Rubini, who happens to be a friend of mine, he may be right that it is next year, and maybe they can postpone it for another five years. We don't know. But in the meantime, we have to we have to live, and we have to we have to make a living in this uh, around these yes. minefields. So, so how 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 do we successfully navigate all of these these mines? Well, I would say uh, the first thing to consider is maybe that uh, your return expectations from investments should be diminished. In other words. You have, say, a million dollars uh, for investments. Maybe you shouldn't think about making like 15, 20 percent per annum as was possible in the 80s and the 1990s. This is out of the question, in my opinion. If people will earn, say, 5 percent on their total assets annually, they'll do very well. Secondly, I would also consider that, that capital preservation, how do I lose the lease? Now, I happen to think, because I visited Atlanta and uh, Phoenix and Florida, uh, Miami, that properties in the U.S., in the south of the U.S., relative to the rest of the world, are very inexpensive. Now, I understand that a huge pension fund will find it difficult to invest uh, 10, 20 billion dollars in homes in uh, Phoenix and so forth. But all I'm saying, if I were an American and I didn't own my home, I would probably consider buying one at the present time because renting in San Francisco, rents are up year on year 9%, in New York more than 10%. So the rental market is actually very strong. Because there are so many people who have lost their, their homes. So they're, Correct. They're competing so for... So many people have been foreclosed upon. Now, just as a thought, and I'm not a socialist, but I just say, basically, if you look at the society, here are the poor people, they buy a house, and they have no money because they're young, they're in their 20s or 30s, so they have to borrow a lot of money to buy the home during the bubble then they lose the home, and then they're forced out. They can't buy another one because they have no money and no credit rating. So they have to go and rent, and then the rents go up because somebody bought the same house, and he wants a return of 8% on that house. So, you know, the, the population, that's why I say in a bubble, the tragedy of bubbles 
engineered by a mass murderer of money of the average American, Mr. Ben Bernanke, creates more poverty than wealth. It creates wealth among very few people and poverty among the masses. That is the tragedy. Mass murderer of money. Yes. I, I love that description of Ben Bernanke. We need a wanted poster with his picture. <laughs> Mass murderer of money. Um, you know, the, the, regarding about buying a house in the United States, is uh, the, the problem, Mr. Fromber, is uh, the, the, the value of, of the homes are falling so fast that I read a month or two ago that, that about 50% of the people who purchased a house in the last two or three years are now underwater, that, that their mortgage is now more than what the house is worth today. And that's, well, that's only within two or three years. So we, you do take a chance if you buy a house right now in the United States that, that in two or three years from now, the, 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 the value of the house is actually going to drop another 10, 15 percent. Could be 10, 15 percent, but I'll tell you something in my life. If for the last 40 years that I've been investing money, on everything I bought, I would have only lost 10%. I'd be very much richer than today. <laughs> okay. So I, I think if someone told me, okay, you can buy this house, maybe it drops another 10%, that wouldn't worry me. But I can tell you I've been to Atlanta and Phoenix. I've seen homes. <clears throat> the construction cost was this much, and the purchase price was, say, a 30 to 40 percent discount to the construction cost. So I think you have kind of a safety net, and in some markets, prices have started to go up. And actually, in some markets, I've been to Manhattan Beach in California. Say a house that 10 years ago was worth a million US is now worth 10 million US. Yes, yeah, so there there are some there are some pockets and where Aspen also. Yes. And Sandy Weil, he bought in 2007, right at the peak of the market, mm -hmm. a condo West 12 for 43 million. He sold it a few months ago for 88 million. Well, those are the uh, exceptions to the rule. Because yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, I agree with you. The typical home in America has gone down in price. But what do you prefer, to buy the Nasdaq in uh, December 99? It went up another 30% before it collapsed 80%. Or you prefer to buy a house that is already down 40 50%. Mm -hmm. are, you, are you expecting a, a market correction in the near future? I think, personally, we've seen the high for the market for the year in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And I think the European markets... They are Portugal, Italy, Spain, Greece, France are either close to the 2009, March 2009 lows or below. So there I see some value in stocks. I don't think they'll go up, you know, like 100% in the next six months. But as a contrarian and as a long-term investor, I say to myself, I can put my money on deposit with the banks. Maybe the banks will no longer exist. Maybe the whole financial system collapses. If I own a house, say in the U.S., I will still have my house. For sure, some idiot in government will tax a lot from that house. But anyway, the majority of people in America own homes, and so... They have to be careful, the politicians, with how much they want to tax from homeowners. Then equities in Europe, and I'm not positive about Europe. I think regardless, the euro stays together or falls apart. We are in recession, and there will be no growth for a long time. But when I compare prices of uh, equities in Asia... And most of my money is in Asian equities. But then I look at European equities. I bought some European stocks because I said to myself, they are now relatively cheap 
relatively. What about the emerging markets, such as uh, Latin America and the Caribbean and Asia, the, the, some uh, of the smaller... For now, I would stay away. But you see, very clearly, we have countries that are opening up in the world Myanmar, Cambodia, Laos, Mongolia, uh, certain African countries, and so forth. There are lots of investment opportunities. But there is a huge execution risk. I've been investing in Vietnam for the last 10 years or so. And although the country has grown a lot, and I was fortunate in the sense that I sold equities near the peak of the market in 2006. Uh, basically, nobody has made a lot of money out of Vietnam who is a foreigner. Uh, the locals, uh, it's like in China and in Russia, you know, the oligarchs and the insiders, what I call insiders. I'm not calling them all cheats, but they have close connections to government officials, like in the U.S., the businessmen and the bankers. Mm -hmm. And so they have a, a privileged position. How, how much has Japan been damaged uh, economically by the Fukushima disaster? Uh, I don't think that, the, I mean, there is damage, of course. But uh, basically, the Japanese economy is something many people don't understand. The Japanese country is a very well-to-do country mm -hmm. with a shrinking population. So they don't have to grow at 7% per annum. They can grow at 1% or 0% and they're still well-to-do. But a fiscal cliff is also coming in Japan. And exactly how will it will be played out, it's difficult to see. But basically, the standards of living in Japan are relatively high. Mm -hmm. Well, the government uh, will run out of cash by October. Uh, so uh, they're, yes, they're in the same they condition. A, a lot Europe. of foreign exchange reserves, and uh, they can borrow money domestically and so forth. But I agree, some problem will occur. But it's not as, in my view, it's not as serious as some observers seem to think. But there is a problem. Mm -hmm. um, and, but equally, the stock market has been down since 1989 from 39,000 uh, 39, to now something like 8,000 or 9,000, whatever it is, I didn't check today. And uh, the market is not terribly expensive. Is the correction in gold and silver over, or is it going to continue? Well, not in my view. I think the correction may still last somewhat. Mm -hmm. But I tell people, you know, you, you don't need to trade gold. Just look at it as a currency, as a safe haven, and uh, just uh, accumulate gold with part of your assets. Don't put 100% of your money in gold and leverage it up, but just put, uh, depending on the individual, 10%, 20% of your assets in gold. I have around 20% in gold. Mm -hmm. Some people who have never bought gold or silver, when you know they look at the prices of gold and they say, well, I missed the opportunity. It's up so high now. It's, that's not, I can't do it now. But um, Well, to these people, you have to tell... Why don't you look at how much the credit market has expanded over the last 30 years by how much the monetary base has expanded, by how much the world's population has expanded and become richer as a result of the breakdown of the communist socialist ideology. There are many more people that today can buy an ounce or two ounces of gold than 30 years ago. So I understand the argument. And, you know, we can talk again for hours, is gold expensive here or cheap? I don't care. 
I just don't trust the financial system, and I want to have some money in something that in a emergency situation will have some value. Sovereign bonds, you know, government bonds, I'm not sure what the value will be, maybe zero. Russia and China and, and several other nations have for years been stockpiling massive amounts of gold. Uh, some people believe that their their actual holdings of, of gold, physical gold, is much greater than what they publicly state. Uh, in a worst-case scenario where if the Western financial system of Europe and the United States crashes, the fiat money system crashes, are, are we looking at a are we looking at a future world um, new paradigm where Russia and China, maybe India, are the dominant financial powers in the world? That I doubt for the time being. But very clearly, there is an ongoing relative, and I'm talking about the relative decline of the Western world vis-a-vis -vis the emerging world. Russia, India, Brazil, China, and so forth, and so on, where the standards of living have been increasing a lot, and in the Western world they've been going down. But don't think that Russia and China and India are problem-free. They have also problems of a different nature. One last question, because I've already held you longer than I promised. Uh, for, for our young listeners who are just uh, starting a family, starting out in, in life with their careers. Uh, well, they're starting my at a advice is uh -huh. don't get married. <laughs> okay. <laughs> First advice, don't get married. Okay. All right. For the ones who already got married, okay, yes, and, okay. and they've got a couple, a couple little children running around, but they're looking around and going, hey, what is happening here? I, you know, um, the, the world that I'm, I'm going into now as a young adult, it looks like it's falling apart. All right. So how do they, how do they plan long term to be on top of this uh, tsunami wave that's rolling around the world? How, how can they be the head and not the tail? But look, I grew up, I was born in 1946. From the day I was born until I was 20, I had to hear from my grandparents how tough life had been during the Second World War, when we had food rationing in Switzerland, we only got one egg every two weeks per person, and so forth and so on. My parents and my grandparents, they brought us up in frugality. You know, you have to save, and clothes that was worn by my brother, I then inherited when I grew up, and so mm -hmm. forth. And this was a different society we saved we didn't consume and i tell everyone in life the one thing you don't want to have and bird and be burdened with is debts debts enslave people and if you can save and then buy a car and if you can save and then buy a house you don't want to buy a house and borrow 90% and then the value drops down and then the bank takes it away from you and sells it to a speculator and then you have to go and rent it for an exorbitant rent. I mean, you know, an economy grows through savings and capital investments, not through consumption. That should be logical to everyone. And... I think that young people have to learn to be financially more conservative. It doesn't hurt not to have the latest mobile phone every year. I'm sitting in front of my TV. My TV is precisely 12 years old. I don't care. In fact, I like it because it's so heavy nobody will steal it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sure. I have a few of those around too. Okay. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Faber, you were raised like I was, you know, I, I, I was taught to be frugal, and uh, I still am today, and I, I it, this is, we've frugal got... Frugal doesn't we, mean to be... Uh, doesn't mean to be cheap. 
And it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't mean, mean to be stingy. You should be generous to everyone around you, people that help you. They should get rewarded properly because you may depend on them and so forth. And if someone gives you good service, you treat him well. And especially you have to treat people that are less fortunate than I have been particularly well. But it doesn't mean that I don't have a car. My wife, before I was married, I had two Porsches. Now my wife has the Porsche and I have nothing. <laughs> That's the way it is. And I, I know... I, I know, have motorcycles, so it's okay. I know you won't say it. I will for you. And I want our listeners to know this, this man that you're listening to, who is a very successful investor and very frugal with a big old TV set that nobody will steal... Yet at the same time, this man has given away millions of dollars for the care of orphans and poor children. And it's because he has those values where he, he knows the proper perspective of money and wealth. And uh, I greatly admire that in, in Mark Faber. Mr. Faber, thank you so much. I appreciate you uh, being on the program today. Thank just, you for having me. Yes, sir. And have a nice day and a nice week. And the best wishes to your listener and especially young people. Never give up in life. Never give up. Famous words of Winston Churchill. Never, never, never give up. Thank you, Mr. Faber. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you. Reporting the countdown to the second coming of Jesus Christ. You're listening to True News, the End Time Newscast. This is Max McLean. Where does growth in the kingdom of God come from? Listen to the Bible from Mark 4. This is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground. Night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself, the soil produces grain, first the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. What shall we say the kingdom of God is like? Or what parable shall we use to describe it? It is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest seed you plant in the ground, yet when planted it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants, with such big branches that the birds of the air can perch in its shade. From Mark 1. Listen to the Bible. It's great for the soul. To hear more, go to radiobible.org. My friends, I believe that over the next several months leading up to the end of the year, we're going to hear some very scary and troubling news about the economy. I would not be surprised that we see bank runs before this year is over. Regardless of what happens, what is important is that you and I know who we are in Christ and what the Word of God says about us. Listen to Psalm 112, one of my favorite scriptures. Praise the Lord. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who delights greatly in his commandments. His descendants will be mighty on earth. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches will be in his house. What will be in his house? Wealth and riches. And his righteousness endures forever. Now listen to this. Unto the upright there arises light in the darkness. So when the darkness comes upon the world, the Bible says that light will come to the upright. The man or woman who fears the Lord is gracious and full of compassion and righteousness. A good man deals graciously and he lends and he guides his affairs with discretion. Surely he will never be shaken and he will not be afraid of evil news for his heart is steadfast, trusting in the Lord. His heart is established and he will not be afraid. 